What's Peg and Tech for the people that are here for the first time? Um, can you raise your hand if you're here for the first time at Spec and Tech? Okay, some 20, 20 people. We'll be a, real quick. We are a community, like we are tonight, a group of people gathering, talking about tech. And uh, we started back in uh, 2016. As you can see, the, the, the room, it was exactly this one. And uh, we were some uh, 40 people, and then we became a lot. And we got some great speakers uh, from all around Europe and the world. Um, there's a few seats here if you want. Okay. Um, and then later on, Spec came, and then we also Beer came. So now, after the event, after the night, uh, we're going to enjoy some good beers and good Spec and good cheese. So whatever if it feels like uh, being a, a very Trentinian person. Um, Spec and Tech is an association. We're a group of uh, eight, eight, nine, 10, 15 people, depending on how many people contribute each night. So there's uh, 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 many people around you that uh, make up this night. And uh, it's not only this night, but it's also other initiatives that we run. Uh, we go on a hike our so-called spec and track. And uh, we go in the mountains and uh, we climb and then we talk about tech and we do the nerds uh, in the outskirts. And uh, we also do initiatives for the elderly people, for people that are not into tech and would like to understand what's a cookie, what's a, a scam, what's a, a phishing email, etc. If any of these initiatives uh, caught your attention and you would like to contribute somehow, let us know, because uh, we are looking for more people to enlarge our association. And um, yeah, we might uh, run new initiatives and uh, a new program, new events, uh, also thanks to your contribution. So just uh, come to talk to me, Nicola, and whoever here in the, in the room that you see wearing a t-shirt of Spec and Tech. If it's not an organizer, you can talk to them anyway. Tonight, event number 50, no, oh, there's a typo. It's, I oh know, it's true, it's number 51. It's number 51, not number 52. And it's called the uh, Pathfinder. And we're gonna have two speakers tonight. And uh, the first one is uh, Paolo Casari from the University of Trento. Big applause for him. <laughs> we can tell you uh, kind of a, a nice story. We. Uh, uh, we had uh, another second speaker till um, three days ago, four days ago, and then uh, she couldn't attend anymore. And we were like, okay, now the event is on Monday, and now it's uh, Friday, 5.30 p.m. And then we called uh, uh, Paolo on his uh, phone number at the office of the University of Trento, which is something that you shouldn't do, especially if you're a student. And he replied, he answered, and now it's our speaker for the night. So another round of applause. <laughs> And the second speaker of the night uh, is uh, Davide Bonetta from uh, Gruber Logistics, who's also the sponsor of the night. Uh, thanks, uh, Davide, for being here. <laughs> As we are telling you, Gruber is the sponsor of the night. We won't tell you much, because they're going to do it uh, straight after our introduction. And now I'm, I'm handing over to uh, Nicola for a, a brief uh, location so information. We obviously all love the spec uh, and the beers, okay? That comes with the networking part, uh, super fun. But there, obviously, we need help as an association. We obviously find sometimes uh, um, supporters and uh, that help us with the. Uh, I'm sorry, it's my first time. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Okay, okay. We do have uh, uh, like Gruber Logistics that help us financing our events, but as an association, obviously, we need our help, your help, and uh, how you can support us. Sadly, we almost finished all the t shirts. We just have two t shirts left, but new t shirts are coming, so stay tuned in and uh, 
let's wait and see what we come up with the new t-shirts. But there are other ways that you can support us. Obviously, there are the stickers that are super wonderful. These are the new ones, so go check it out. They are free. You can take as many as you want. My, my laptop, laptop is like full with the stickers from Spec and Tech. Uh, and, uh, but you can also help us with uh, Sam. <laughs> That's over there for the donations. We have contactless donations. Let, look at Sam. It's over there. It's handsome. <laughs> during, <laughs> during the networking part, you have to go there with Sam. So you can find the stickers. You can find Sam. Fantastic. You can also check out our website, okay? Made by Toto, some new design, uh, pretty cool, go check it out. Okay, you can also find our past events. And if you want to give uh, a talk or you're a potential sponsor, you can also contact uh, through the, our website, so go check it out. And uh, recently, we made a partnership with uh, Trentino Sviluppo, where you can find a lot of job posting, but not only if you are a dev, uh, a lot of cool job posting from uh, uh, all around Trentino. A bunch of companies that are based in Trentino and are looking for mechanical engineers yeah. uh, or these kind of mythical creatures. Uh, if you're one of them and not necessarily a front-end or back-end developer. Tech jobs, uh, yeah. cool. You'd better check out. And if you click on it, you will be redirected on their website. You can find a lot of jobs. So. Also, go check it out, <laughs> the, their website. And uh, obviously, if you already don't follow us on all the, all the social networks that there are, do it. Uh, we post a lot of cool things. And we also recently made uh, the, the after movie of the retreat. So we put a lot of effort into it. So please, check it out. <laughs> and after the event, you will receive an email with the, the feedback, it's super important to us that you give us an, all, an honest feedback. If it's bad, the event went bad, please tell us if there is something that we can improve, please tell us because it's super, 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 super important for us. So thank you a lot. And uh, tonight, a big, big, big spoiler for the next event, big event, please keep your calendar free for that day because it's something super. Yeah, on the 19th of April, just really save it on your calendar. It's not going to be held here. It's going to be on another location. Just to tell you the size, it's a fucking auditorium. And uh, uh, next slide, please. Yeah. And it's going to be uh, an event called 40 Years of Tech. And the speaker, the keynote speaker will be not even, none other less than Andrew Tannenbaum. And Andrew Tannenbaum is probably, uh, I don't know, if you studied networks or anything in computer science, uh, you studied on his books. Uh, he has made uh, five different books uh, that were printed 175 different times. Uh, he's been around for 20 more years in the tech field. Uh, um, and he's been one of the people behind uh, uh, what became later Linux, uh, in a way. So it's, uh, I don't know, like an astonishing speaker, and he's going to be our speaker, thanks to the collaboration with uh, Dizzy, uh, the Department of Engineering of uh, Computer Science and Engineering here in Trento, uh, during the ICT days, uh, 18th, 19th, and 20th uh, of April. There's going to be the ICT days. If you don't know about them, go on uh, ictdays.it. And uh, on the 19th of April, we are going to wait for you at the Auditorium di Lettere. Uh, I don't know. There's a capacity of 300 people. Let's try to see if we, if we go sold out also that time, OK? Cool. Final. Tonight, we're still at event number 51, not 52. And the event is named uh, Pathfinder. And if you've got questions uh, for our speakers, uh, you can go to slide.do spec-51. Because remember this joke, last time we said spec-50, and then spec-51 was taken and then ST was taken, so this time it's spec-51. For the people that are not familiar with Slido, you can ask whatever you want to the speaker, at least uh, interesting questions. And uh, the, we will select uh, those that are more interesting, and uh, you can also upvote the questions from other participants. So what we were gonna ask our speakers will be clever questions.
So, Davide Bonetta on stage is our first speaker of the night. Uh, and warm sponsor, applause. so yeah. big round of applause. And, okay. Thank you very much and welcome to all of you to this event. I'm just spending some minutes talking about uh, Gruber Logistics, okay. Uh, Gruber Logistics is a logistics transportation company that is based in Ora, so 35 kilometers far away from here. Uh, it's an about 90 years old company, so quite an old company, and is uh, still a 100% family-run company. Uh, we have 170 employees uh, in uh, uh, Trentino Alto Adige, uh, but in total we have 2,300 employees all over Europe mainly. Uh, last year we had a turnover of more than 700 million of euros and we are, uh, our asset currently is done by 750 trucks and one, uh, 150, 1,500 trailers. Uh, we are 60 branches in 14 countries, so we are quite big, the company grows a lot in the last years. Um, just a, a quick idea about the, uh, our business. We are working uh, mainly of full truck load. We will see later as it's uh, really important for the topic we are presenting. LTL, that means uh, moving uh, pallets and so less than truck uh, load uh, goods. XTL, so special transport, huge trucks that are going around the highway with the uh, escort and so on. Uh, POW, that is project for cargo, so iron and ocean, uh, and relocation, relocation and assembly and logistics. So we're taking care goods from our customer and we manage, completely manage uh, their goods from the receiving to the delivering. Uh, one thing that is really, I really want to mention about uh, the company is that we are, uh, apart from the digital innovation, that is uh, um, our, my main job, I want to share that we are really focused on sustainability and alternative fuels. We are working with uh, yeah, the first uh, uh, full electric trucks that is uh, operating to one of our customers. We have uh, more than 80 trucks that with bio LNG, so we have a really huge department that is doing a great job trying to reduce the CO2 impact on the environment. And this is really uh, an important topic for us. Just a quick uh, information about the, uh, our headquarters in Oran, just to share. Uh, we, ha we have 171 employees, I would say uh, quite young. With the uh, average age is 37 years old. Uh, that comes from 13 different countries. They speak Italian, German, and English. And uh, yeah, the youngest people is 19 years old, and the oldest is 67. So we are a quite range of uh, people. So uh, let's move on the main topic uh, of this evening. Uh, we are talking about uh, routing and how to certify have a certified route inside our system. Uh, a bit of agenda, so we are going to see the context, just to do in the way that you can understand maybe a bit better the solution. Uh, we will see why we need a certified route for our uh, mm, orders. Um, the challenge we face developing this sort of uh, uh, task and uh, just a brief overview of the architecture we applied, so how we have solved this issue, and some results and some further development that we, we have to do. So uh, we are focusing on, uh, as I said, one uh, main business is the FTL business that stands for full truck load. Uh, this uh, business means that we go to one customer, we load a full truck, uh, to the loading place, then the truck uh, is fully booked for the customer that goes to the delivery place to unload the truck. So the customer is somehow, uh, let's say, paying the whole truck. Um, 
And then there is a, a special type of services, the XTL, that is completely similar, but again, uh, this, the goods is different. The track is not the standard track that we see daily, but it's a track that uh, we call heavy loads that is loading something special, so big machinery, something uh, that you can for sure see on the street. And we have special peculiarities for these, and this is important to mention, because not uh, all the routes can fit that track, for sure, but moreover, we need some permits to go on the route. We cannot take a track for the XTL, go to the highway, to the 822, whatever, and uh, without any permit. So we need, uh, there is a process that uh, is going to require some, some permits. So, <coughs> why we need a certified route? There are, um, uh, as I've mentioned in the abstract, if you see from uh, a place A to a place B, there are many uh, street to that uh, a car or even a truck can take, okay, uh, usually uh, this uh, route was uh, suggested from the device of the GPS of the truck, or maybe the driver was using his smartphone with any application he want, but this is not the exact truck that Uber expects that the driver is doing, because uh, doing the, uh, the, the, exact, uh, the specific truck that uh, is expected means uh, uh, to avoid a route with uh, size restrictions, so we need to be sure that uh, the truck is going on routes that are allowed for that size and that uh, weight and so on. The total cost of the truck uh, needs to be, uh, let's say, calcul calculated in a proper way, so we're, any extra cost uh, is uh, less of profit for us, so it's really important that uh, the we take the cheapest truck the cheapest uh, route. We have some extra cost that usually this device doesn't take into consideration. We have some extra cost if we go to the Switzerland, for example, uh, or if we take some tunnels uh, and so on. And again, uh, for sure, in the XDL business, we need to be sure that the route where the truck is going, uh, uh, it's uh, allowed based on the permits that we have. Um, what was happening is that the in the past, that uh, the dispatcher, that is a person that takes care of the driver, uh, giving all the information to do their job in a proper way, was giving some recommendation to the driver. But uh, yeah, the driver sometimes they take this into consideration, sometimes not. So we need to have a saved structured object of the path for each single order inside our system. Uh, I just go on a, a bit with the, with the process quickly. Uh, we receive an order from our customer that has to load from uh, whatever, Milan to Paris, whatever. All these orders of the, of the goes into a platform uh, where our planner, that today is a person, in the future will be a tool probably, but for now it's a person, uh, see all the open orders of our customer. On the right, they see all the resources, so the tracks available, and they do the, let's say, the perfect matching by reducing the empty kilometers, so from moving from the old point of loading to the new one, and so on. Uh, and then, once done, once uh, the matching is done, uh, a dispatcher uh, takes this order, completes some information, uh, and in this activity, now he's going to define this certified route. So in this step, uh, the dispatcher has to say, okay, for going to this place, to this place, the truck has to do this route. There is no other option. Once done, the, the, the order goes to the driver app, that is the application, mobile application that uh, the, our drivers has, uh, have on, on their hand, okay? And, uh, and then the driver can start doing uh, uh, the job, and for sure the dispatcher needs to monitor constantly what he is going to do. Um, so, what was our challenge? So, we had to build this uh, platform for this uh, uh, type of, for creating this certified route, uh, but we, uh, um, was really, the, it was really necessary to build a, a tailored solution. So, uh, we are a cost we are looking for we were looking for a cost oriented route instead of a distance time oriented uh, so 
not all the GPS tools are doing that. Uh, we needed precise geocode location, and uh, we also needed to customize the routing restriction. So to add uh, some something on top of what the third-party service can offer based on our internal rules. And um, yeah, uh, another point that was, was not really easy to find is that we don't want to have a system that calculates the route and the driver is going to use that, but we want the system that calculates the route and the dispatcher can change that, but needs to approve that. So better if the route is well calculated the first time, but if it's not, the dispatcher is responsible for the route so they can change with a drag and drop or whatever. So, based on that, uh, we saw that our main challenge was that it was not possible to develop this solution inside our uh, legacy transport management system. When I say also in the future TMS, I mean transport management system. Um, the dispatcher, so the person that is taking care of uh, this activity, is not at all willing to move to another application. So say I'm doing this task on the old tool, and then I take a web page, I put the ID, and I do something. This was not possible at all. Um, also because the calculation of this route is mandatory for the dispatcher, so we cannot have a guarantee that they are going to do them if it's not inside the, the same flow uh, of uh, the other activities that they do. Um, so, yeah, the only solution was to create a, a proper flow between the legacy TMS to the new application that guarantees that the activity was done without uh, any special legs, so lags. So this is really quite a challenge. So what we have set up, just uh, going to the architecture, the, the solution is based on the event-driven uh, architecture. I don't know how many of you knows that. I hope s uh, some of you. Uh, it's, a, um, it's an architecture that um, it's a push architecture, let's say, uh, where an event uh, uh, it's uh, produced uh, from, a, from a, uh, an event producer. Okay, this event contains uh, a body with all information of uh, the message that uh, uh, he wants to communicate uh, to to tell uh, to the other part of the world. Um, so, um, yeah, it's really important that the whole flow of this. Uh, process is uh, nearly real time. There is uh, no uh, lag again on this process. So once the producer sends something in this uh, type of architecture, uh, all the consumer are able to, uh, in whatever, less than a second, uh, consume the message. Uh, and uh, again, it's really important that the producer and the consumer are decoupled. So there isn't any uh, issue of uh, API calls that failing and uh, what I have to do in that case and so on. So we have some of uh, our uh, products that are part of this architecture. The first is our event producer. Okay, we call it Gruber Beyond Collector. Gruber Beyond is the brand of the digital innovation team uh, and also the name of most of the product. Uh, this tool is uh, connected directly to the legacy TMS. So we had this, we have this legacy TMS where most of the activity are still done there. Uh, we have connected this tool uh, that is constantly reading the database, looking for any change for any, for not any, but a lot of type of objects or subjects. Uh, and once they see any change for a, for a single object, a single topic, they build a JSON object uh, in real time and they, put this message in the service bus, mm, really all quite real time. Um, and yes, this, this topic is then sent in the service bus, or in the bus, we will see later what is the bus, and, uh, and, the, system, and the message is available for other application. Some data, this, this uh, service is developed in .NET, is deployed on, prem on premises uh, of the uh, where uh, all the other the database is located. Uh, we have uh, developed an auto-generated model via scaffolding, means that every time 
the TMS is updated from the software house, we, have, we can run a, a script to update the models so we, don't are, we are not suffering for this type of uh, update. And we have currently 12 different subjects, topics that are generated from this uh, service. Second part of the flow is the uh, Azure Service Bus. This is the most easy to develop because we buy that from Azure, so it's not a big issue. Uh, but it's also the heart uh, of the of all our Gruber Beyond platform. Uh, it's a fully managed enterprise message broker of Azure. Um, and a message broker in general is used to move messages from a source to a destination. Uh, it's uh, nice to mention that uh, it's somehow divided into main parts. The first part is the queues that is uh, usually dedicated for a point-to-point -point communication, means that we can have a producer that send message and only one consumer connected to the same queue to receive that. But we, and we are mainly working on that, we, it, but also with topics and subscription, where uh, again we have a, a producer that sends a message in the topic, and many subscri subscribers that can subscribe to the same topic. So in a, uh, my, uh, uh, micro application uh, architecture, we have different microservices that are interested on the same object for different purpose, and they can com be connected uh, and subscribe to, the, to a specific topic. Uh, some other features that I want to mention, and we are using quite a lot, is that the dead lettering means that if one uh, consumer of the message has some trouble managing one message, maybe one external API is not working or whatever is happening, a database connection uh, is failing, the message is put into a second queue of that topic that it's called dead letter, and uh, if uh, the, si the, the issue is solved, we can re-elaborate this message and without losing any uh, information, any task. Uh, it manages sessions that guarantees the first in, first out of the message. And uh, also really nice, uh, we allows to schedule a delivery in the queue. Means that they can push a message and say, this me I want this message uh, active in one day, 40 hours, whatever. And we are using a lot of these to schedule some tasks uh, without, any, without the need to build uh, some specific tool that do that. There are different uh, libraries to connect to the service bus. We use the .NET and the JavaScript for our infrastructure, but we also build a, a common library on top of that to manage some features and connection. Uh, just some facts, sorry. Um, we are managing 650,000 messages per day in our service bus, so there is really a lot of messages exchanged between the different microservices. And today we have 21 queues that are uh, active, 28 topics with 82 uh, different subscriptions. So it's really widely used for us. Uh, the microservice for the position is one of our uh, uh, microservices uh, and um, is the um, tool that is responsible for the uh, calculation of the route in this case. So it's a consumer consume the message that our uh, uh, producer has produced. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, his task, uh, uh, it's just, uh, are just, uh, just but to create a pre-calculated route, so uh, they receive an information of a trip and they start to calculate it, uh, the route, they do the geocoding of the addresses. Um, they are connected to a third-party service to do the calculation, really important. We haven't developed a microservice that do the root calculation. We are not able to do that, but we rely on a service that is here maps, that is doing that. Uh, we have added on top of the response of the external service, some of our customized logic to, uh, to add some Ruber uh, rules. Um, yeah, it has also the rule to notify to the user the task for the road calculation. We will see later the front end and how we uh, interact with the user. Uh, yeah, for sure, manage all the GPS position of the tracks. Um, notifies the user in case of the track goes out of route. So with the route that we have calculated, we have a, 
uh, a system that is analyzing all the GPS position and notifies if the track is not there where we expect. Um, yeah, and exposes the, need, the API for the, all the front-end activity. Again, some data, it's uh, developed in Node.js with TypeScript. Uh, it has a dedicated MongoDB database. Uh, we calculate about uh, 18,000 routes per month, uh, and we have 640 connected GPS devices from the black box of our trucks. So, Moving on uh, the front end, okay, we have two main uh, applications that are involved in this uh, flow. Uh, one application is called uh, Gruber Beyond the Notifier, and it's a funny application that is uh, loaded to all our users uh, on the bottom right of the, uh, of the screen and is a desktop always on top application. So it's a notifier, it's a notification system uh, built, uh, customly built that by us. We have not used any Microsoft uh, notification and so on. Why? Because uh, um, we have a real-time notification for the logged user, this was possible. Uh, there is a connection with, uh, via socket to the microservice, but what is really important is that this uh, tool it's, uh, shows a blocking pop-up to the user. means that for some specific type of notification, the user sees this pop-up and he, it's mandatory for him to, to execute that activity. And this was not, was not possible with any uh, tool uh, integrated in the operating system. Uh, we have different uh, type of notification, and each of them have a color and features uh, that uh, differs from each other. It's a, multi uh, it's a desktop application. Again, it's developed in Electron. It's uh, usually released on a PC, but we are also able to release on a Mac if we want. Uh, it has a backend with Node.js and MongoDB again. Uh, we manage 82,000 uh, notification per month uh, with, with 21 different notification types. So for this process of the route calculation, uh, it's just one of these 22 different notifications that we send. The other application that is really, really uh, key of this process is the front-end. Uh, My tools, um, it's the name of the platform that we uh, use internally to develop all the applications that are used by the Gruber users. Um, it's, um, yeah, the position application is used to manage in general all the route and uh, GPS position tasks. Uh, for this specific uh, point for the certified uh, routes, uh, we have uh, uh, the system is proposing this first auto calculated route and allows the user to, as I mentioned, change the, uh, the proposed route to confirm it. Um, it's focused on the cost information, we will see later. So all the information that are shown to the user are really uh, based on the, on the co total cost of, the, of that route. Um, shows the difference between the expected and the current route of an in-progress or executed track, uh, trip. What is, does it mean is that once the driver start to drive the, uh, the track, and he's going out of the route. Uh, the, our colleagues are receiving this sort of notification, and they can see what was the original route, where the truck is going, uh, and then we can decide if uh, the driver has to turn around or just update the route because uh, there are no other chance or is not really convenient. Um, and yeah, and there is a feature, the main feature of this, this to show the real-time position of all our trucks some information about the full tank, uh, the kilometer to the next stops, and so on. This is how it appears uh, in, uh, um, for a calculation of a route. We have a loading place and the unloading place here. Uh, the dispatcher uh, tried to change uh, by a drag and drop, tried to change the proposed route. The system is showing to the user that the original route was 480 kilometers uh, with uh, 360 euros of costs. 
uh, these include uh, the cost of the driver and also the fuel, plus 169 of the toll cost with the total duration of this. The new calculation shows clearly that uh, it's not really convenient to change this route, so the dispatcher can, can easily see what uh, the any change of the route, how the any change of the route impacts on the price, on the cost of the of the truck. And we also see a situation where uh, one of our customized logic on top of the request we have sent to the uh, to the third part uh, uh, provider is uh, is used because we have a rule for Gruber that going through the Switzerland costs 100 euro. Okay, so uh, for the provider, the most economic uh, route was going through the Switzerland, but by adding uh, one of our customized rules, the system has changed and just decided to go to the Brenner route, right? So this is uh, yeah, one of uh, the way we show to the user that one of these requests uh, of these rules has been applied. Uh, yeah, I just mentioned for sure some small pieces of our arch architecture, okay. I just want to share that we have a platform called, called Gruber Beyond uh, that is much more, okay. We are managing several parts of the business of our company. Uh, we have 22 backends, uh, microservice backends. Most of them are developed in Node.js, uh, some of them in .NET. Uh, they are usually working with the MongoDB database, someone with the SQL, and we also started to work with the Elastic uh, Search database to uh, improve some the response of some autocomplete or research. Uh, we have 12 front-end applications um, that are uh, developed in Vue.js or Angular, mainly in Vue.js. We have developed a uh, uh, logic of micro front-end application to uh, have to try to apply the same advantages of the microservice also on the front-end. So we have uh, these applications are independent applications that are loaded into a shell um, easily through an iframe. They communicate to the shell, to the container via events. And uh, this is really useful for yeah, the, the development team, first of all, because we can implement uh, in a, in a more flexible way, all the application and release a new feature in a more flexible way. Um, yeah, we have four different types of authentication for the users. All these microservices and microfront are deployed in uh, uh, are the Docker that are deployed in Kubernetes, and we currently have seven nodes on that, and we have some automatic CI/CD pipeline for the test and production environment. Uh, just some results, sorry, okay. Uh, what we reach with this project, for sure a reduction of the transport cost. Uh, we have been able to develop the out of route notification, I already mentioned twice, that is uh, telling to our colleagues that the truck is not on the proper route. Uh, we have a real time information of the missing kilometers to the next stop, so uh, before that, we can we were able to estimate based on a Google uh, analysis. Now we have an exact number because we should know what is the number, uh, the track that is the path that is missing. Uh, we have a certified number of kilometer for each trip, so it is really important for uh, very important for the cost calculation of the company. Uh, we have again a toll cost assigned to single trip, so mm, same purpose. Uh, and yeah, we have uh, in general improved the uh, work for more than 600 involved users between dispatcher and drivers. And again, we want to avoid, uh, we try to avoid that uh, trucks are going to unauthorized route. Just to see, this is something happened some months ago where one of our truck, even if it's well hided, uh, fell into a route that was not able to fit <laughs> him. Um, yes, we have some further development on this uh, already planned. We have the 
plan to develop an application that a navigation system uh, that is to give to our drivers to allow them to uh, navigate through that route. Uh, we are going to develop uh, quite a hard uh, topic that is uh, the calculation of the estimate type of arrival. That it's not really easy because it's uh, strictly connected uh, to the time that the, tr the driver has still available to drive because there are different uh, uh, laws that limits the number of hours that an, a truck can drive, uh, not really easy to calculate, and also the traffic. And for sure, once we are able to, is to understand and have a proper evaluation of the estimation type of time of arrival, use this information to uh, share it with the customer, maybe notify them that the truck is arrived in one hour and so on. So that's all on my side. I hope you uh, find this topic stimulating. If you are interested on joining us, you can uh, get in contact with us. Um, and yes, that's all. So if you have questions, I'm really here for you. <laughs> They do have questions. Good. Um, first, what is the role of open source products and libraries in your systems? Do you make use of them uh, and do you contribute back? Uh, yes, we use them. We are not really good on contribute on them, sincerely. <laughs> uh, can you name a few examples? Or of libraries? Yeah. Or something uh, that you use in your processes, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we are using a lot of packages of the node environment. Yeah, so n not really small products, I think, but all the huge uh, products that are available or open source. Yeah, I don't remember some small single product that, uh, yeah, that we use. Okay. Can, um, can you take in, consi in consideration real-time traffic and modify the route uh, after it has been approved? We don't do that now. Uh, we are going to do that once we are able to guide with the GPS system the driver. Yes. Um, so yeah, we, the driver is not allowed to change the route. The GPS system is not allowed to change the route, but the driver can, the dispatcher can receive notification and override, override that. Yeah, yes. Um, how do these vehicle tracking devices connect to the servers? Uh, how do you manage to get the GPS tracking in areas with slow or absent mobile data? For the GPS, uh, we are relying on some black box that are for sure connected via you know, SIM card uh, and so on. We, I think we have some delays on that. There are not really a lot of issue of coverage. We right. have a while on the Gruber driver app, so when we talk about our application, it's uh, an offline first application, so they can do any activity they want and they can sync once they have uh, uh, some coverage, but um, on the GPS, we, do, we are not facing many issue of coverage uh, for that, so yeah. Okay. Probably the size of the data or whatever, the network that they're using, it's... Okay. Um, ha has the driver any power on the decision of the assigned path based on the unpredicted problems? You said that it no. cannot really... No, no they can't oh. really. I it mean, cannot. they probably do, no one it's But yeah, they should call the dispatcher. So we have one dispatcher that is in the office and it's usually take care of 15, 20 trucks right. and no more. And uh, they need to get in contact with the office and uh, ask uh, for any authorization. Right. Yes. So it's still a person you aim at replacing uh, this person in the future? Yeah. Okay. Um, regarding sustainability, uh, would it be more sustainable to put different shipments from different customers on the same track? Is this something feasible? Like, are you actually working at this or? We do that. Okay. It depends on, um, on the type of the shipment. Okay. If we are talking about FTL transport, usually it's the company itself that is paying the full whole truck that is uh, uh, full that. I mean, it's giving uh, goods for the whole uh, size of the truck. Uh, we have some situation where we do partial load and we try to mix 
different orders into a ship, uh, say a truck. But there is a the business LTL that I mentioned that uh, for the smaller size, it uh, mm, relies on a network of also other uh, partners to put the collect the uh, goods on in one truck. And yes, we are usually moving with full trucks, uh, fully loaded. Okay. Fully yeah. loaded, okay. Um, where do you get the information that a route uh, is permitted for si size restriction? It's uh, the here maps uh, right. uh, service that provides this information. It's quite uh, different compared to Google, maybe that doesn't have any uh, logic on the track size, size or weight. Uh, with this application, there is a dedicated service for tracking system, and there we can manage size and uh, weight. Um, there's plenty of questions, like I cannot <laughs> ask all of them, so we'll probably get in touch with Davide at the end of his talk. <laughs> probably um, the final one that we can close with uh, is, uh, why didn't you replace the legacy TMS altogether? <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it's... Uh, Too legacy. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, you, you mean redevelop internally the whole TMS? Yeah, or... Yeah, or probably or with our team it requires... Uh, 200 uh, years. Okay. <laughs> no, uh, but this is, mm, yeah, I mean, the idea is that we uh, focus on building a platform that is going to able to connect a different, well, properly skilled tool to do that part of the job the best we can. Okay, we don't want to develop the TMS internally. We want to create the core of the, our application that is able to connect to different services. And this is done step by step by uh, removing some of the task uh, from uh, the legacy TMS and see what the best solution for that part of the job. Got it. Okay, so if any one of you wants to uh, redevelop uh, from scratch a uh, uh, TMS, uh, yeah. get in touch with Davide. Uh, <laughs> at the end of the talk, go ask him question and then uh, apply to Gruber. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, and now a few seconds, and then we are ready to kick off for the second talk of the night. Paolo Casari from the University of Trento. Um, I think the stage is yours. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, it's a pleasure to be in front of you tonight. It's my first Spec and Tech. Not sure if many will follow, will decide uh, also based uh, on your feedback afterwards, I guess. So it's also extremely very good to be in front of, uh, as a professor, I mean, uh, it's very good to be in front of uh, some of your uh, current former students because uh, two reasons. Well, first of all, they are your students and you've got to love them already. But the, first, the second one is uh, the, um, uh, you never get really much of a chance uh, to say more than two words about what you do extra than the topics of the class. So here's a chance where I have more than the usual two minutes. So this one will be about uh, a few components that we put together and uh, tried to simulate realistically in order to see what cooperative uh, adaptive uh, cruise control can do. That's also known uh, as platooning. We will get back to that in a minute. And uh, Given that, let's see if uh, we can manage it well. We can use uh, the wireless infrastructure, which is not just the 4G, current 4G, and multi-access uh, edge computing infrastructure, but also the future 5G infrastructure, to let it do something meaningful. And uh, when we imagine that in the future we will have autonomous vehicles, and these autonomous vehicles will be uh, the perfect vehicle, the one that uh, follows the rules, uh, coordinates perfectly, never creates a problem, and so on, which is what everyone aims for, otherwise they don't get the trust of the customers. Uh, when we have that, there may be reasons where that's too much. So there may be cases where you don't really want to abide by the rules that much, and you want to break a few of them. So. First of all, acknowledgements. This is great cooperative work with great people. One of them is Michele Segata from uh, University of Trento. Uh, he was at the University of Bolzano, to be completely fair, when we did uh, this work. Uh, Constantina Yimba and Vincenzo Mancuso, former colleagues from India Networks Madrid, Spain. And uh, Christian Quadri and Valerio uh, Cislaghi from uh, Statale University of Milan. So, uh, we do two things tonight, as I said. First thing, uh, can we 
control, whatever that means. We will get back to that in a minute. Autonomous vehicles from the network. Uh, in this case, we're talking about the cellular network. There are many ways, but we will talk about cellular networks. And second one, can we lead autonomous vehicles to be less strict about how much do they abide, how much they abide to the traffic laws? So, first one, let's go into a few basic concepts related to platooning. So, the big picture is that uh, you have uh, autonomous vehicles, and autonomous vehicles are embedded with a number of sensors. So these autonomous vehicles have uh, sensors for distance, emergency situations, uh, perceptions of the surrounding environment, whatever it is, and uh, of course actuators. So they can take decisions. The simplest decisions that any car can take today is to keep speed. So you set the speed manually, and then the car automates everything else required to keep the speed. So it accelerates when you're going uphill, brakes, or well, not really brakes typically, but uh, uh, decelerates or uh, stops accelerating when you're going <coughs> downhill. Emergency brakes, if you're going too far uh, towards the car in front of you without braking. So these things uh, are all possible. And uh, besides that, we have an upcoming infrastructure, which is going to be not very much faster, but definitely faster than uh, the 5G infrastructure and uh, definitely uh, offering additional, like, much, much uh, lower delay for specific use cases, at least. There's a caveat here, there's a question mark, because, uh, well, we'll get back to that uh, in a few slides, and uh, uh, it basically means, is this really necessary for what we want to do? So let's try to also answer that question later. The sum of these two, or the good composition of these two, will probably lead to vehicle cooperation. So it means that uh, not just your vehicle, but all the vehicles on the road will cooperatively perceive what's going on and adapt to it in a way that uh, you can realize several things that you cannot do today. So one of the things is uh, you can organize groups of vehicles to keep a formation, not just uh, maybe a very long line of uh, uh, 20 or 30 trucks, but uh, also, multi-lane traffic being coordinated. And sometimes you can also get to those very scary scenarios where you have six-lane intersections uh, between two six-lane roads uh, per direction. So six plus six per direction. And then uh, you get uh, no traffic lights and all the cars going through the intersection smoothly and uh, probably at 20 centimeters from a collision. So all those uh, scary things uh, should be possible through vehicle cooperation. Now. There are several ways in which you can cooperate. You can stay by yourself and be a fully autonomous vehicle, use your sensors more or less the way you're doing it today. Or you can uh, cooperate in a way. So cooperating means that you try to talk to the infrastructure, be it the network infrastructure, be it some roadside unit, for example, the, uh, the traffic lights or other sensors. And these sensors help you take decisions, make decisions, sorry. And, uh, Otherwise, you can merge these two roads and get to the cooperative automated vehicle. So something that uh, uses both uh, its own autonomy and the coordination with other vehicles to achieve some bigger goal. And uh, also be more resilient in face of uh, emergencies, in face of uh, dangerous situations, and so on. And one of these ways to cooperate is the CACC, the Cooperative Adaptive Cruise Control, also known as platooning. So you get some infrastructure. The infrastructure tells you, hey, look, you need to now move at this speed. You can use the right lane. And uh, all the cars, uh, all the vehicles involved in this platoon simply abide by this rule, keep some distance, and uh, manage to maintain a stable formation in face of a changing road. Um, just uh, before moving more into the details, uh, it's uh, good to say that uh, vehicles can cooperate and can communicate in a number of ways. You have a vehicle to everything, that's the typical V2X, uh, uh, V2X uh, acronym that you won't find in this picture, but that means uh, infrastructure, the, the network, meaning the network at large, the internet, uh, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to grid, to pedestrians, to sensors, to devices. So there are all these sorts of communications that ultimately enable one form of, or another of uh, vehicle cooperation. So going to the specific case of uh, cooperative uh, adaptive cru cruise control, 
of course, what you want to do is uh, to have some advantage out of it. It's not just that you can release uh, your uh, uh, steering wheel, have a coffee, and forget about the road. It's uh, watch a movie, maybe. And what you want to do is uh, to be effective uh, when uh, you talk about your energy and uh, uh, the organization of your movement as well. So in a typical platoon, what you want to do is to be sufficiently far from the car in front of you, and of course the car on the back should be sufficiently far from you and everyone until the end of the platoon, such that uh, emergency situations don't uh, take you or don't uh, catch you unprepared. And at the same time, you want to be very close, as close as possible to the car in front of you because that enhances your uh, uh, aerodynamics. So basically, you can take the flow of the car in front of you and reduce your friction. So that's the ideal case, of course. So ideally, you get to set a distance between these uh, subsequent cars or subsequent vehicles and uh, try to maintain it as much as you can. Now, let's uh, try to do uh, the same from the network. So one, uh, let's, let me switch back. One obvious way to do it is to have these cars talk to one another directly, peer-to-peer -peer communications or vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle, in a way that uh, messages get where they need to get. For example, this car can be the controller. They get uh, reports from the other cars, and then they say, "Hi, you accelerate, you brake, you accelerate, and you brake. And uh, by repeating this over and over, you get to keep a stable formation. Can you do it from the network? Well, uh, the whole point of this is to try to say yes to this question. And uh, the opportunity to do this is because we have good infrastructure. Now, we are starting to have really ubiquitous, uh, allow me the quotes on really, uh, really ubiquitous infrastructure that uh, at least for uh, most of the areas that you want to cover gives you uh, good connectivity with uh, sufficient speeds and uh, sufficiently small delays. Not only that, you also have several, uh, for LTE would be multi-access uh, ads uh, computing center for 5G probably uh, better terminology is uh, edge cloud uh, or uh, other kinds of names like that, where you can uh, place computing functions. So the natural computing function that we have here is the platoon control. It has uh, to run an algorithm over and over, uh, multiple times per second, uh, and therefore, having a dedicated uh, resource on some server that is not the car in front of everyone would be good. So, ideally, this is a very nice situation, but uh, does it really work? So, first of all, one of the issues that you may have is that connectivity may not be really ubiquitous. So. Do you have connectivity? Where you have connectivity, is it connectivity sufficiently good? The network is not just yours, right? The network uh, can be used by other users, and uh, you may not have enough time to really you know, allow yourself uh, to be prompt in your control commands. Uh, do you have enough compute capacity? So your algorithm may run on this computer. This computer may suddenly be overloaded with whatever, video transcoding or other uh, very, very time-consuming uh, operations and may not have enough resources for you. And maybe you didn't, on a non-dedicated network, subscribe any contract to keep your compute resources. Very unwise, but uh, it, it is possible. So maybe you want to move somewhere else. So is this migration something that can be done? Is there a maximum number of vehicles that it is safe to keep in the platoon? So all of these questions are relevant questions uh, that depend on how well-performing the network is. So let's uh, go to uh, the very basic two ingredients that you need. So the first ingredient is the platoon controller. So you want software that uh, is proven, that we have already. And that runs in a sufficiently fast way, but also that takes into account that you will have delays. It is impossible not to. You cannot guarantee some millisecond latency to everyone all the time everywhere. So you will have delays, and you will have to take this into account uh, very specifically. And uh, you have to be intelligent when you decide where to put your computing resources, where here or here, or whether to move them. Because all of this creates a delay, and this delay may disrupt your instantaneous control enough to create a, a danger. And there's also another thing. While you keep moving, your network uh, will be composed of several cells, and uh, sometimes you will be under the coverage of one cell. You move, you will change cell, 
And this may happen very fast, especially on highways and other scenarios like that. It may even happen that uh, part of the platoon is served by this cell over here, part of the platoon by another cell, and uh, this second cell, for example, is very crowded with either traffic. So that all of these can be issues. So basically, what we have been doing is, first of all, put our hands into the controller. We had uh, a basic controller that worked uh, with uh, um, you know, vehicle to vehicle communications. Uh, we operated it on uh, vehicle uh, to infrastructure communications. And uh, we took into account specifically the channel delays and the fact that your information is aging. Uh, if your network withholds your packet because you don't have resources to send it now, then you will get it later and uh, your information may be outdated. You need to take this into account. And then we basically have, uh, once we compute a control directive, we have the network uh, talk to everyone all at the same time or almost at the same time. And uh, we see what we get. So basically, without uh, going too much into any math, uh, this is what I was saying before. At some point, it is possible that uh, your uh, time uh, of reporting is not what you would like to have. So at the end, uh, you have uh, reports from all the vehicles. These reports are delayed in time. And you wait for a maximum window until you finally compute a control directive. And you use the most recent information from the vehicles in, uh, in order to compute this directive. OK, that being said, because controller is probably the most developed part of uh, platooning, um, migration algorithm design is also another very important ingredient. So what you need to do is understand where you control your platoon from. And in order to do this, because it's a very dynamic, uh, a very dynamic decision you need to make, and uh, everything here can change all the time, Different cars, uh, oops, different cars may be uh, running uh, and using resources from the network. Different applications may be taking the Mac. Maybe this Mac uh, is uh, uh, probably overloaded. This Mac uh, is not overloaded and so on. Uh, what you want to do here is uh, deploy some form of uh, automated learning. So our tiny bit of machine learning we also did, and we put uh, specifically a Q-learning architecture. Q-learning is just one uh, way machine learning can be implemented, and uh, it's based on the observation of the result of actions that you take. So you have a, an environment, you have actions you can make in this environment. For example, do I migrate? Do I not migrate? Do I migrate here or there? And then what uh, you decide is uh, whether you did it well or not. And based on that, you accrue a reward or a penalty. And uh, probably over time, you will learn the best uh, decision. That is the one that leads you to the best reward or the least penalty, at least. So basically, this is uh, to show that you have a target distance. You have uh, a, a tolerance of that distance. And the way you compute your reward should be inclusive of these variables. So you cannot just decide that this mm, computer, this edge cloud server is better than the other one. You need to decide that based on uh, how your platoon is performing. So if your choice, uh, for example, let me go back here, sorry, uh, to move the platoon from uh, here to here brings you an advantage, that advantage should be measured in terms of how well your platoon keeps formation. Okay. So long story short, the reward uh, of our system depends on all these parameters, which uh, are a glorified way to say, if the platoon is doing well, then you should accrue a reward. Otherwise, uh, of course, you should accrue a penalty. And uh, your options are basically two. One is uh, the processing uh, capability. And of course, uh, the processing capability means uh, the one of the server where you're going to upload your uh, uh, control application. And uh, the next one uh, will be, of course, which servers are uh, free and which are not. And uh, you may want to be more or less conservative if you want to privilege uh, situations where the Mac server, the server is unloaded, you will probably uh, be uh, an aggressive migrator. Otherwise, if you want to avoid the migration delays, maybe you will be more conservative and you can tune this with uh, these two parameters. So for this first part, what we tried to use at the beginning was this uh, uh, setup. So 
there are several types of uh, research works. Uh, this probably classifies as one of those research works uh, where it took so long uh, to put together all of this uh, that uh, you finally want to publish a paper about it. So anyway, the point is that there is a network simulator here, it's called uh, Omnet++, that includes extensions that specifically account for both uh, an LTE network, can be 5G, but uh, here's where we found out that LTE was sufficient, and multi-access edge computing for computing facilities attached to the network. And then we had an interface uh, to uh, this module called Veins that has another interface to Sumo. Sumo is the simulator of urban mobility and uh, it's a validated simulator for uh, vehicles uh, moving uh, on roads uh, that you can establish and uh, that move according to some predefined vehicle mobility patterns. So all of these put together caters for realistic network simulation, realistic computing simulation and realistic uh, road mobility simulation. So we took uh, some uh, schematization of uh, a Bologna highway and uh, basically here what we have is we generate uh, a platoon of vehicles at A that are born one after the other and then these guys go in a loop uh, through all the road uh, following the order of the letters. Okay, So what we get to here is of course several things that we discussed before, right? So first, while you move, uh, the platoon will be served by different cell towers. Fine, it's, it's exactly what we want. We want to have uh, different coverage conditions and we want to have endovers. So we want that the traffic uh, that we need to report the situation of each vehicle and take control decisions goes through each of uh, these towers. And then we have uh, MAC hosts. So in this specific case, we wanted to simplify the thing and we have uh, one MAC host uh, per base station. Normally that's not the case. Normally you have a few, MAC, uh, a few base stations being served uh, by the same set of MAC hosts. So what we have here is that each of these MAC hosts uh, is uh, an alternative where to put your control. And in addition to this, each MAC host uh, has some other job to do. So uh, for example, you simulate uh, some traffic on the MAC host, this is the percentage of average load on the host, and depending on the number of the host and the, on the time, you see that the traffic oscillates differently. So if there is anything that uh, the learner, the Q-learner agent should learn, is uh, to take advantage of this and possibly place your uh, control function where the server is most unloaded, okay? If that matters at all. If it doesn't matter, then the Q learner will understand. But if it matters, it should do this, okay? So uh, a simulation basically works like that. It's uh, like uh, an executive like this, where uh, you should see that uh, uh, events happen, and this is of course slower than real time, but uh, it is just because it's a graphical interface. Events happen, and they start getting closer to execution time, execution is here, uh, this is logarithmic distance from execution time, and you see the uh, vehicles here being deployed, starting to make uh, initial handshakes uh, to communicate positions, get policies, and so on, and uh, also attach to the actual cell towers, right? And then at some point towards the very end, all the setup of uh, the platoon uh, and so on is done, and uh, we should see that the vehicles start moving doesn't take uh, much longer, but at some point it will happen. So, okay, this is one very last message, I think. Here it is. And uh, finally, messages take time because maybe they are delayed by some network delay. Eventually, these guys start uh, moving along the road uh, towards the south. I mean, even if uh, they don't immediately now, they will eventually. I promise, for sure. There we go. <laughs> okay. So, so what should you check for the first thing? You should check that your platoon is really working. How do you check that your platoon is working? You have the leader of the platoon do crazy stuff and make sure that no one else is crashing into anyone else. So in this case, the leader of the platoon is uh, continuously accelerating, braking, accelerating, braking using this sinusoidal pattern. So the second, platoon member, which is also named here the first follower, the yellow line, 
has a very hard time understanding what the guy in front of him is actually doing, right? So, <laughs> so basically, you should set a space, say 10 meters from the car in front of you, and uh, this guy keeps accelerating and braking, and you try to do your best to cope with it. And uh, of course, uh, you are doing not too bad. Huh? So you are not getting below two meters uh, below the threshold, meaning you are never closer than eight meters from this uh, guy when you should be more or less 10. So it's fine. And then the nice thing you want to show is string stability. String stability is a concept by which uh, uh, you dampen these oscillations uh, towards the end of the platoon. So what happens is if uh, you are counting the third and then other members, we have 30 members here, up to the end, you should see smaller and smaller and smaller oscillations. So this is the case with the third, it already dampens it very much. And then the ninth and 15th and last platoon members, they are very stable, around 10 meters. So this is nice. It means that the controller is dampening oscillations. Good. Having said that everything is uh, sane, now we apply all of the loop and we have migration strategies uh, applied, so we have a Q-learner which uh, starts uh, making attempts uh, and uh, making sure that uh, it is convenient to migrate or not and eventually deploys a policy and uh, makes it possible to apply the policy to the scenario. So here we compare against the state of the art. This protocol was state of the art, uh, hopefully before we arrived, and uh, basically what happens here is that uh, the protocol tries to keep the control function closest to the platoon. So you will move here, it uh, will probably get to node one, here it is, and then you keep going on, it will eventually go to node four, and here it is, and then uh, it will start switching depending on which is the closest one. So which one is offering you the smallest delay, actually. And in our cases, whether you try to be conservative or not conservative related to migrations, well, uh, you see that you start, uh, you start always again with this uh, eight figure of eight uh, tour. And uh, you see that you switch at the beginning, you switch at the beginning in both cases, but then you stop. So eventually, this is also a meta result uh, from our work, if you will. Uh, it doesn't really matter to migrate a lot and to switch uh, very, very close to the, where the platoon is. It matters to be stable enough such that you don't have to move a lot of logic every time and incur delays every time you do it, because that takes time. And uh, in this case, for in, in this case, we maintain the policy stable, uh, maintain the control location stable. So, okay, the decision of the Q learner is not to migrate, for example, the control logic from one Mac host to one to another. Is this effective? Does does this mean your formation of vehicles is stable? Well, yes, it is. Because, again, you keep uh, punching uh, the, your platoon uh, by having the leader do uh, accelerations and breakings and accelerations and breakings. And what you get is that uh, if your speed changes between 20 and 30 meters per second, so it's uh, almost 70 to almost uh, 110 kilometers per hour, so uh, you see that uh, the migration policy of the state of the art, uh, uh, follow me, Every, every once in a while, starts having bigger oscillations. It means uh, that here, you are not getting your control messages in time, or you are not getting reports from the vehicles that make, impossible, that make it possible to compute control directives in time. So something is going wrong. Whereas our policies, the red and the, and the green, do better. So this was also, let's say, a sanity check that uh, we are doing something meaningful here. And, uh, the other way to control this is to run several simulations. Of course, once you have a simulator, you want to play with it and uh, take a lot of measurements of uh, spacing across the uh, vehicles, from one vehicle to the subsequent one. And you would like also this to be stable. First of all, because it means you're under control. And second, because if uh, you would be a passenger of a vehicle that keeps uh, getting farther and closer, very far, very close, very far, very close to the vehicle in front of you, you would not be happy. So basically, you see again, this, these are box plots and 50% uh, of your values from the 25th uh, percent smaller to the 75th percent higher are within the box plot. And uh, you see that while the state of the art has bigger outliers and the larger boxes, 
we get, uh, after the initial setup, which is uh, natural for everyone, after the initial setup, you get uh, to be extremely stable, and all of the, uh, most of the values you measure are compact uh, around uh, the distance threshold you're trying to make. So, because the only thing that changes between the state of the art and our own policies is the way you decide to place your uh, control functions around in the network, this is uh, a proof that uh, it works better. Of course, it can always happen that uh, things go south, meaning that uh, eventually you get to have issues with the control. So let's say, for example, here we make an example, there is a core network routing delay, and uh, sometimes the delay increases. It increases uh, largely. It may stay more or less stable, increase more, or increase even more. So in these cases, what you need to do is to try to avoid that this disrupts your platoon or that makes cars crash into one another. So what we did was to develop a, con a second control loop, which basically we call the salt and that uh, measures whether things are do going well or not. If they are, everything is fine and you see the patterns that you have already seen uh, with respect to spacing in the previous graphs. If delays prevent actual actuation on uh, the vehicles, then here's what starts happening. You see that, for example, here at uh, 50, well, less than 50 milliseconds, this delay is starting to disrupt things. And here, what happens is that uh, the vehicles stop being part of the platoon, switch to automated, meaning non-cooperative, adaptive cruise control, and uh, implement their own strategies to to take a safety distance from the vehicle in front of them and uh, accelerate and brake depending on their own local sensors without coordinating. And then things uh, go better, let's say at 100 seconds, and here the vehicles start perceiving it and they go back to forming the platoon again because the second platoon member is now trying to follow the first platoon member, which is always doing the acceleration braking pattern all the time. So every time things go south, you resort to not cooperating, to for your own safety. And if things go very south, meaning you have this yellow graph that means lots of delay, uh, you see that uh, crazy patterns uh, start uh, to happen, but these are not crazy. This means that, for example, the last platoon member doesn't understand what's going on because of these delays, doesn't get any message, and it resorts to almost stopping to avoid trouble. So that uh, the spacing here increases a lot, and uh, the reason why it increases a lot here is that here it got uh, very scared that it would crash because the spacing was almost zero. But so anyway, doing this switch helps you keep your uh, distance and then only when things uh, start going better again do you resort to going uh, uh, back to cooperation. Okay. So very, uh, very last uh, for this first part, uh, and then the second part is much shorter, I promise. But uh, for this first part, uh, what we saw is that 4G and 5G networks uh, with their own uh, edge computing servers are enough uh, to drive uh, platoons uh, under good uh, or sufficiently good connectivity conditions, and whenever these connectivities do not uh, occur, you can always resort uh, to some uh, Local, uh, local decisions, which means uh, you stop cooperating, do adaptive cruise control, and that's it. And uh, another result uh, was that, uh, yes, you could use 5G technology, which may improve delays and uh, allow you more flexible computing infrastructures, but even 4G is okay for this. So this could be done I under good coverage, uh, enough, go sufficiently good coverage. You shouldn't take this as a statement that only if you have four, uh, four bars uh, in your signal indicator, this is going to work. It's better, but it's not necessary. Okay, so even 4G technology should be able to support uh, this uh, uh, operation. And with that, I will take uh, another five minutes of your time, or slightly less, to s discuss the case where we have autonomous vehicles uh, that are abiding to the rules too much, and uh, maybe this causes a trouble in case of emergency. So one typical case of emergency is when you have uh, an incapacitated driver, someone having uh, an issue, a health issue maybe, 
and uh, not being able to drive his car and so on. But his car has autonomous capabilities, and therefore it could, in principle, drive itself to a hospital, for example. Fine, this is good. The point is, typically, automatic, automated driving uh, is uh, or should be conservative. I mean, there is the extreme, uh, the extreme uh, mode uh, of a very famous electric car, car make. But uh, anyway, you wouldn't typically attach to that into a crowded city. And therefore, you still uh, have the issue how to get the passenger to the hospital as fast as possible. So one possible solution is that uh, you should uh, try to seek help from people who can bend the rules. Things that can bend the rules are the humans. So. I mean, we do it every time, come on. Every time you drive, uh, <laughs> you non, don't necessarily stop at a pedestrian crossing or at a traffic light that's going yellow, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is uh, one way. And uh, basically, in a typical situation, you can expect uh, that uh, if this is a deployed service, there may be a number of multiple available drivers that want uh, or are available to take the lead. So uh, basically, what you can do is to mm, detect the emergency, and then the car asks uh, a human to take the lead, leave breadcrumbs behind, and then the automated, drive, automated car follows these breadcrumbs. These are waypoints, and the waypoints left by a human driver will be less conservative than the waypoints left by the automated car. So. What we will do in this respect is uh, a decision. We need to make a decision which one driver is best. And uh, typically, there are two things, at least two things you want to consider. Whether the car is good enough, so you don't want to follow a car that's lower than you, probably, otherwise you would as well do it by yourself. Uh, and you want to have a good driving behavior. If you don't have a good driving behavior, you may not be able to keep pace with the vehicle in front of you. And, uh, he or she may go to the hospital while you are still in the middle of the city. So basically, here's what we will try to do here. We will try to find what's the best vehicle, knowing that there will be vehicles with uh, some aggressive or cautious drivers and some uh, uh, powerful or weaker engine. And again, just like we did before, the reward that we want to to place for this uh, work uh, is uh, a reward based uh, on how well the service is working, not on how well the network or whatever is working. We want to make sure that the time it takes uh, to, br to bring you to uh, your hospital is uh, some ideal time, and that uh, you're able to follow the leader of the vehicle in front of you, not just uh, let it go and not just uh, be too close to it. You want to stay at a distance that means uh, you're both going. So again, we train a Q learning system, and uh, this time uh, we play with another tool. So this time we used Carla. Carla is a, a very nice project for. Uh, it was born for training uh, people for uh, for uh, remote uh, driving, and uh, we interfaced it with uh, sort of the same uh, simulator, network simulator that we had before. Except sometime we did resort to a 5G network because we wanted uh, the best performance we, we would get. And uh, we set up uh, a city truck. This is one of the standard uh, available in the simulator, where you have initial location of the candidate lead cars, and you have uh, your own car in distress, and the coverage of the networks. So here, you want to get here to the blue marker. And in order to do that, you need to meet someone here in the city, let's say. And then you need to make a full detour through the highway. I forgot the exact route in order to actually be able to turn uh, left uh, or turn right here and be able to stop. So the nice thing to see, in my opinion, here is how the thing is uh, uh, the, the, the Q learner is learning. So at the early stages, you would try to explore your options while you're learning what to do. And uh, at the early stages, you would get to choose. Uh, some uh, more powerful vehicle, let's say 25% more powerful, and uh, regardless of the driving behavior. So this would be extremely aggressive, this would be extremely cautious, you would get to something in between, you would start exploring here. Then you start converging, sorry the scale is different here, it will be the same as this one later on. But uh, then you start acknowledging that maybe a nice powerful car, but with uh, a 
careful driver is probably better, until you get to the end and you resort uh, to staying with, uh, okay, some car which is uh, 50 or more percent uh, more powerful than you, but with typically a uh, cautious driver, and then only very rarely more aggressive drivers, which are these bars over here. So this is the final policy, and when you apply it, you see interesting things. So this is a simulation of uh, your leader and your uh, follower for the speed profiles and of their spacing. So you see that uh, when uh, you are at the beginning, uh, you cope up very well, and then uh, maybe you start to have some much more spacing because the leading driver is too aggressive. So here's what is going on here. It's not stopping for you, so you are losing track. You still have the breadcrumbs, so you will eventually catch up, but uh, it's not good uh, to be too far because the leader, uh, it's also good to have the leader in front of you when you are experiencing this. So if uh, you take a converged policy, then you are choosing slightly less uh, aggressive but uh, powerful cars. And uh, in this case, you see that the speed profiles are much more similar, first of all, such that the spacing uh, decreases. There are some peaks every once in a while, but uh, the speed decreases, and in most of the cases it remains uh, too towards the mm, setting you wanted to achieve. So in this case, what is happening is that uh, a more prudent leader with a powerful car either stops or slow down uh, to wait for the target vehicle, so that uh, you have always a sensation or a feeling that uh, your uh, lead is actually leading you to home. So this was a brief detour to take into account uh, that uh, these are nice scenarios to investigate. As autonomous cars uh, take uh, momentum, they will be very relevant, and it will be very relevant to know about uh, these possibilities and these uh, options that you have. And uh, one of the things uh, that uh, I want to make is that, uh, okay, you have uh, a good 5G architecture that's coming, not going to be upcoming for a few years, but uh, it's coming. Until then, 4G is enough uh, for platooning applications in most of uh, the cases. Uh, and for as much as you can train intelligent choices, there are cases where intelligence can only reside on someone who knows uh, how to uh, you know, cut corners. And for the moment, uh, at least at this stage, uh, we thought that uh, a bit of uh, human behavior in machine intelligence uh, would do better. So the, if you want, uh, I know that uh, you will have the presentation later and uh, you will be able to download it. If you want, uh, there are two references from which I took some material. There is also a uh, submitted paper that extends uh, this uh, first uh, study uh, of which I talked about uh, in this uh, presentation. And uh, with that, I would really like to thank you for your attention. I know it's late, but uh, uh, before leaving you go, I would like to play this, so we don't just simulate this, we want to do it for real, sorry, and this turns around uh, roughly, but this is uh, a thesis uh, work that we are doing with uh, one of uh, the students uh, of uh, Michele Segate and myself, and uh, this is uh, basically one of our donkey cars. Uh, it's here in one of our labs uh, where it basically localizes itself and follows a predefined track with a controller. So. This is just the first step. The next step will be to take the car and have it follow another car and then to build a platoon and then or possibly to build a big city model in some bigger lab. But uh, we will see how that goes. It doesn't take uh, just one day. So for that's very much the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Now a few questions. Sure. What would vehicle, uh, vehicle cooperation look like on road in which only half of the cars are autonomous? Yeah, that's a very, very good question because uh, there will be a very long uh, period in which that will happen. And uh, the way the community is looking at that scenario, scenario now is to improve the cooperative perception of the surroundings, which doesn't just mean that uh, several cars uh, cooperate to sense that a pedestrian is running across the street in a rogue way, but uh, also it's uh, making sure that we can join our sensors, for example, 
making sure that we can communicate the, out the output of our leader sensors such that uh, all the cars uh, know what the other non-autonomous and maybe non-cooperative cars are doing. Okay, thank you. If the platoon loses connection to the network, will it try to regulate itself peer-to-peer? -peer? That's a, a very good question, and it's definitely uh, the first option that was ever investigated for platoon, peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, for platooning. And uh, the, f the answer is it depends. Uh, it is possible, of course. It is probably one of the things uh, that it's advisable to do. We didn't do it specifically here because there's a lot of research on vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle coordination for platooning, but uh, it is definitely an option. Okay, so also peer-to-peer -peer is available option uh, Yes, uh, then it depends, uh, uh, you know, it definitely, definitely. Okay. Then it depends on the size of the platoon. Maybe 30 vehicles peer-to-peer -peer is uh, better managed through the network. Uh, two or 10 vehicles uh, or maybe slightly more is also good to manage peer-to-peer. -peer. Okay. How do you simulate 5G networks? And do you just take the maximum delay defined by the standard? No, 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 no. Uh, the simulation of the 5G networks uh, proceeds through the SIMU 5G package. SIMU 5G is uh, a package developed uh, by the University of Pisa, initially funded by Intel, who basically funded it uh, to have some simulator that would be validated and realistic for 5G networks. And it implements the standard and also the edge computing extensions and so on. So uh, the simulation is basically a plain 5G standalone network that uh, we have deployed using the function of that simulator and therefore it replicates both the statistics uh, of the wireless connection that you will have and the statistics of uh, the communication delays and the probabilities of error. And uh, the last questions, there are a lot of in interesting questions but you can ask them later. So do you think CAR could ever cooperate uh, and solve Bryce paradox? Which paradox? The, the I read it earlier. The Brax paradox should be the ones that uh, adding lanes. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, adds complexity and time uh, in the in the system. Understood. Again. Okay. No. Just uh, wrote it on on Wikipedia, so I, no, I, no, no, no. I read it on Wikipedia, so I might be wrong. <laughs> no, sorry, I didn't know it off the top of my head. Um, so as I said at the beginning of the presentation, uh, probably yes, but it will be very scary. I mean, uh, I myself, uh, we're doing research on this, and I myself, I'm not sure if I would like to be on a car that uh, really coordinates uh, to solve a 12-lane intersection and never stop. So anyway, okay, that being said, uh, whenever the system is proven, okay, th this is just a joke, but uh, whenever the system is proven and uh, you are sure that uh, it is uh, fair safe for the one in a million times it will not be fail safe. Uh, it will resort uh, to non-cooperative schemes that uh, keep distances and uh, try to make it fail safe, then uh, of course uh, you can do it. And then the paradox would possibly be solved. Thank you a lot. Another round of applause. Thank you very much. We have Another thing now, okay, so Belka was kind enough uh, uh, to g donate to the community a couple of uh, MacBooks from uh, 2015. If someone really, really needs it, okay, uh, can apply to the forum, uh, it, the link is our, in our Telegram group. So if you really need it, you can apply to the giveaway and you can have it for free. But again, please, only if you really need it. Yeah, um, well, um, it's going to be open till next Monday. So Monday 27 we'll close and we'll pick uh, the two people that we, th we think are most, uh, um, they have an urgent need of this MacBook. They're from 2015, so not the, uh, the newest one, but still very useful. Um, I think we're done with the night. So uh, a couple of things. First, uh, remember, Next event is on the 19th of April. Second, uh, this is a profit association. It's uh, run by your donation and also by our sponsors as well. So thank you a lot for being here tonight. Um, if you can want to help us, uh, you just go there. You get one of the last t-shirts or some whatever swag. You drop a coin or you so pay with whatever you like. Um, tonight we made a mistake. So 
in general, we have 1.5 kilos of, of uh, cheese, and tonight we've got three. Um, <laughs> so there's going to be more food for you, and I think it's another uh, reason for donating and supporting the association. So if everything goes well, we see you in one month. We shut down the uh, recording now, so see you on YouTube. Thank you.